Oh, there's something in my chest that I can't hide When feelings get involved, I'm terrified Cause I've been here before and said goodbye Hold on. Okay, there I have sound. So I don't know what's going on, why it keeps losing my sound. But what I was saying was we're, um, we're on part seven 
Uh, we're on lie 18, which I actually read last time, but my computer froze up. Um, so before I could finish it. So we're going to start with it. It is Senator Joseph McCarthy concocted the Red Scare and there was nothing to fear from communist subversives. And then, of course, we have quote. There's only one quote for this one. McCarthy never uncovered a single communist agent in government. He was the shrewdest and most ruthless exploiter of anti-communist anxieties. That's by George Brown Tyndall and David E. She, America and Narrative History. Okay. Is any word more quickly invoked as a means to shut down debate in modern American America than McCarthyism? For nearly half a century, the left has raised the specter of Senator Joe McCarthy to intimidate people into backing down, often successfully. What exactly was McCarthy's record? Joseph McCarthy was a relatively insignificant U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, a close friend of John F. Kennedy, and later Richard Nixon. McCarthy was the godfather to Bobby Kennedy's first child. In turn, Bobby was McCarthy's devoted staffer. The elder Kennedy, J Joseph, stood by McCarthy long after others had abandoned him, and after a speaker at Harvard announced both McCarthy and Alger Hiss, John Kennedy exclaimed, oh, denounced, I'm sorry, I said announced, denounced McCarthy and Alger Hiss, John Kennedy exclaimed, quote, how dare you couple the name of a great American patriot with that of a traitor, end quote. In the Senate, McCarthy was placed on the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, PSI, which acted as a counterpart to the infamous House Un-American Ac Activities Committee, HUAC. Both had been established in the 1930s to deal with Nazi and Communist subversion. The PSI, which McCarthy chaired, had the specific charge of investigating communism among federal government employees and while the former was contained during world war ii the la latter expanded in the administration of franklin d roosevelt how did mccarthy the junior senator from the farm state become the point man for all anti-communist rhetoric in the country with all history context is crucial At the time McCarthy burst onto the scene, the United States had witnessed the following in a period of just five years. The Soviet Union had refused to withdraw from all conquered and occupied nations at the end of World War II, despite promises to do so, enslaving millions. China had fallen to Mao Zedong's communists. The USSR had exploded its own atomic bomb five years ahead of what Western spies claimed was possible. Soviet spy rings, especially the famous Klaus Fuchs ring, were exposed. Other spies, traitors, and informants were uncovered within the U.S. government, including Alger Hiss and Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who gave the atomic secrets to the Soviets for their bomb. And the American communists seemed to become more radical and confrontational each day. Hollywood, for example, was rife with communists, so much so that the incoming president of the Screen Actors Guild, Ronald Reagan, had to simultaneously defend his industry from congressional attacks that led to the blacklisting of the quote-unquote Hollywood 10, while at the same time purging communists from the industry. Against this backdrop of increasing communist advances, Joseph McCarthy came to prominence. In the begin, it began with a speech for, for Lincoln's birthday activities on February 9, 1950, in Wheeling, West Virginia, when reporters said McCarthy claimed to, quote, have here in my hand a list of 205 active members of the Communist Party and members of a spy ring that were made known to the Secretary of State and who nevertheless are still working for and shaping policy in the State Department, end quote. The infamous list to which McCarthy referred contained 57 names of security risks already given to the House App Appropriations Committee, whose cases were still pending. 
Then he cross-referenced the list with another one of 284 security risks given him, of whom 79 had already been dismissed. For 205 original names and 57 still employed at the State Department. McCarthy claimed, and a surviving copy of his speech has 205 crossed out and 57 written in, that he said only 57 were still in government. Regardless, the press immediately ran with the headline, State Department has 205 commies. Aside from the Rosenbergs, who were out-and-out -out spies, perhaps no figure was more important to the Soviets than Harry Dexter White, the Harvard economist who in 1941 was appointed assistant to Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau, Jr. He had aided at the Treasury Department he was aided by at the Treasury Department by Solomon Adler, Frank Coe, and Harold Glasser, and all played a role in preventing emergency gold from reaching Chiang Kai-shek in China, contributing to the rampant inflation and the collapse of the anti-communist government there. McCarthy and many other Americans thought that various individuals inside the U.S. government preferred Mao Zedong, the communist, to Chiang whom they viewed as a totalitarian, quote-unquote. Another New Deal agency, the Agricultural Adjust Adjustment Administration, teamed with communist agents, including at one time Alger Hiss, J. Ed, uh, Alger Hiss, period. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, estimated there were 200 to 400 active Soviet spies in the United States, aided and abetted by the 54,000 members of the Communist Party, USA. If anything, McCarthy underestimated the number of so active Soviet agents. In addition to White, there was Lawrence Dugan at Treasury, Michael Strait at the State Department, and John Apt at Justice. Treasury documents were passed to the Soviets through Nathan Silvermaster and Elizabeth Bentley. Worse, Morgenthau re relied so much on White that he made him the Treasury Department's representative to the planning groups that included the American spy organization, the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. As the authors of the Venom Secret, v v Venona Secrets, include, concluded, oh, sorry, <sighs> quote, the Soviets believed that White was in a position to advise them on the thinking of high-level U.S. government officials, end quote. White had also possibly extended the war in Germany by leaking a plan rejected by Roosevelt and Churchill that threatened to divide Germany into small provinces. White died before he could appear on McCarthy's lists, but he was precisely the type of person the Senate and House investigators realized was a problem. When Whitaker Chambers testified before Congress in 1948, he outed communists working in government such as Lee Pressman, Harold Ware, and John Apt, who, in addition to his time in the Justice Department, had also served in the Department of Agriculture. Henry Collins, National Recovery Administration, Charles Kramer, National Labor Relations Board and Office of Price Administration, and Victor Perlow, Office of Price Administration. Contrary to the notion that McCarthy was out to expose individuals, he repeatedly stated, quote, I do not have all the information about them, end quote. And that is his, his goal was to, quote, show that there is something radically wrong, end quote, with the State Department investigation program. McCarthy's use of terms was indeed loose and deserved criticism. Quote-unquote suspected communists became Communist Party members and, uh, quote, and, quote, a friend of a communist became a, quote, close pal. Yet his overgeneralizations did not distort the essential truth which was that the State Department had not carefully vetted its employees and that many communists and yes, spies either and yes, spies either had been working in the U.S. government or were still working in the government when McCarthy brought his charges. 
Dorothy Kenyon, who was appointed to the UN Commission on the Status of Women, for example, admitted that she belonged at one time or another to at least a dozen different communist front organizations. A more substantial figure in McCarthy's crosshairs was Owen Latimer, often viewed as his most famous quote-unquote victim, the editor of Pacific Affairs, a pro-communist journal that excused Stalin's purges, he traveled in China for the Roosevelt administration and sought to swing U.S. policy there toward Mao. In fact, McCarthy never said he was a spy, but that he behaved like a Soviet agent. He was employed by Soviet agents, and his friends were Soviet agents. Lattimore was even put into his position by a Soviet agent. He lied about not working for the government. Lattimore was a White House liaison to the State Department, where he had an address and where, under oath, he testified that he did not handle Lachlan Curie's mail, when in fact he did. He was indicted for perjury for the, these lies, for which he was never acquitted. Charges were dismissed on technical grounds. The McCarran Committee concluded he was a quote-unquote willing instrument of Soviet policy. Moreover, Latimer was paid by the Office of War Information, he had hardly changed the China policy. Sorry, he had hardly changed the China policy single-handedly as McCarthy led people to believe. But neither was he as pure as the wind-driven snow. Latimer influenced FDR, serving as his personal advisor on China in 1941, and accompanied Vice President Henry Wallace on his trip to China. Upon his return, he claimed the Democratic Soviet Union's slave labor camps and gulags were akin to, quote, a combination of Hudson Bay Company and the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, end quote. As it turned out, the FBI had kept Latimer under surveillance since 1949 and noted his close connections to many identified Soviet agents. On the day that the Tidings Committee which had been formed to examine suspected communists in government, announced that the U.S. government was a, quote, free of, free of communist infiltration, end quote. The FBI announced the arrest of Julius Rosenberg for espionage. This was shortly after the communist North Koreans had invaded South Korea. Yet despite continuing support for McCarthy's basic claims that the communist menace was real and that infiltration of the U.S. government and military had actually occurred, the Washington elites were contemptuous of him. Some of that was McCarthy's working class background and his non-Ivy League education. Many despised his direct appeal to the American public. Dean Acheson called him, quote, the Galateer and leader of the mob, end quote. Richard Rover called his supporters members of the Zanies and Zombies Club. In fact, one-third of all Americans in 1951 had never heard of McCarthy, and in 1953, two-thirds had an opinion, had no opinion at all of the senator. This is hardly the rampant pitchfork-bearing mob led by Zanies and Zombies that some have called McCarthyism. And uh, to, to the absurd lie that McCarthy never exposed a real communist in government, consider Gustavo Duran, Mary Jane Keeney, Edward Posniak, John Carter Vincent, plus Latimer, and a 1954 article which revealed that every security or loyalty risk McCarthy brought forward in his February 20th, 1950 speech had either resigned or been dismissed from government. Other Soviet operatives in the government whom McCarthy named were T.A. Bisson, Cedric Belfrage, Leonard Minns, and William Remington. And later, Ann Coulter duly notes was the latter, Ann Coulter duly notes, was, quote, killed with a bar of soap in prison by a patriotic inmate, end quote. Even when it came to the army, where McCarthy eventually went abroad, he was correct in arguing that several known communists who were proven security risks not only remained in the military, but received promotions. 
If anything, McCarthy was too late. By the time he had identified many of the communists in government, the FBI had watched them for years, though in many instances they retained their jobs despite being labeled security risks. Isn't that just what the FBI does now? While in truth, much of the government has been cleaned up by the time McCarthy gained the public eye, he nevertheless pushed anti-communism onto the front burner of politics. Many in government on both sides of the aisle stood to lose from the exposure of the incompetence more than complicity of the federal investigative agency. Agencies. But the senator often played into the hands of his enemies with his carelessness and exaggeration. When he began his who lost China attacks that ultimately impugned George C. Marshall, his supporters finally deserted him. By the 1980s and 1990s, however, information trickling in from defectors and the former Soviet archives made clear that most of McCarthy's targets were exactly what he said they were, spies, fellow travelers, and threats to U.S. national security. So there we go. That one, I... Took two, two, two times trying to read that one, but we got through it. Um, I really didn't know. I've heard the term McCarthyism my whole life, and I never really knew what it meant or what it was referring to. Now I know. Seems to me I only ever hear it coming from one side of the aisle nowadays. All right. Lie number 19. The Rosenbergs were not spies and were wrongfully executed. And this one, eh, it's four pages. All right. So we start off with three quotes this time. Julius Rosenberg, a former member of the Communist Party, and his wife Ethel were convicted in a controversial trial on charges of conspiracy to commit espionage and sentenced to death in April 1951. The Supreme Court refused to hear the case. The controversy over their guilt has continued to the present day. That's by John uh, Jean Boydston et al. Making a Nation. The second quote, although they were not major spies and the information they revealed was not important, the Rosenbergs were executed to the consternation of many liberals in the United States and elsewhere. Well, they were still spies, even if they were minor spies. Uh, That is by Mark C. Carnes and John A. Garrity, American Destiny. In the third quote, the government's case against the Rosenbergs rested on the testimony of their supposed accomplices, some of them secretly coached by the FBI. And that's by John Mac Farragher et al. out of many. All right. Has there ever been any communist anywhere who was guilty of anything? Reading liberal historians, it would seem not. Certainly to listen to the modern defenders of Julius and and Ethel Rosenberg, they were harmless, kind-hearted people who, no doubt, read to lepers in between building homes for Habitat for Humanity and working with Haitian AIDS patients. It's nice to know, isn't it, that historians decide whether, quote, the information they revealed was not important, end quote. In fact, the Rosenbergs potentially could have condemned millions of Americans to death by atomic firebombs had their Soviet paymasters not feared U.S. retaliatory strikes that would kill millions in Russia. Nevertheless, the husband and wife spy tag team provided Soviet intelligence agents with typed notes and even a sketch of the famous lens device, quote-unquote, of the the Nagasaki bomb that experts agreed hastened the development of the USSR's atomic bomb by at least five years. Judge Irvin Kaufman, who sentenced them, rightly said, quote, I consider your crime worse than murder, and by putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused, in my opinion, the communist aggression in Korea, with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000, end quote. The case against the Rosenbergs began in 1950 when the U.S. government 
and the United Kingdom unraveled a communist spy ring built around a Los Alamos physicist, Klaus Fuchs, himself a Soviet spy during the war. Fuchs then led the investigators to Harry Gold. Then, in June of 1950, the, the trail led from Gold to David Greenglass, then from him to his sister and her husband, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Over time, Greenglass's testimony about the involvement of Ethel changed several times. At the trial, he said she typed his notes. Later, he recanted to a reporter claiming that he had lied to protect his wife, Ruth. He never wavered about the key role of Julius Rosenberg, who not only forwarded the lens device sketch to the Soviets, but also actively recruited other agents for the KGB. Greenglass, however, flip-flopped flip again in interviews with Ron Radosh and Joyce Milton, claiming flawed memory but adamantly stating he had not perjured himself at the trial. Defenders of the Rosenbergs initially, i.e. in the 1950s, not at the time of their arrest in 1950, marched through a procession resembling that of a terminal cancer patient from denial to anger to almost acceptance. First, they claimed the Rosenbergs were communists but not spies. Then they admitted Julius was a spy, but Ethel was not. Next, they conceded that whatever role Ethel played was unimportant and that the material supplied by the Rosenbergs was not critical to the Soviets getting the bomb. The final acceptance stage came from Walter and Miriam Schneer, who kicked off the Rosenberg's defense with Invitation to an Inquest, 1965, repudiated their conspiracy theory that the government had framed the Rosenbergs and in an August 1995 article in The, the Nation, agreeing with Ronald Radosh and Joyce Milton in their then controversial condemnation of the Rosenbergs, the Rosenberg file, 1983. Just how important was the information the Rosenbergs supplied? Even if the Soviets used none of it, they would not excuse the Ro that would not excuse the Rosenbergs one iota. Treason is not the same as murder. The act of aiding and comforting the enemy does not depend on the enemy's being aided and comfort comforted only on the attempt and intention of those committing the treason. If nothing else, giving the Soviets material that was a dead end technologically, which this was not, would nevertheless advance Soviet weapons programs by showing them what did not work. According to ex-premier of the USSR Nikita Khrushchev, who quoted his spymaster via Cheslav Molotov, the Rosenbergs, quote, provided very significant help in accelerating the production of our atom bomb, end quote. Molotov was less specific, saying, quote, I think they were connected with our intelligence effort. Someone helped us mightily with the A-bomb, end quote. And then he then, however, noted that he wouldn't say more as he might, quote, have use for it in the future, end quote. But Richard Rhodes, who studied the documents for his book, Dark Sun, The Making of the Hydrogen Bomb, compared the dates of the Greenglass-Rosenberg information with that of the Soviet physicist Igor Kurchatov and concluded that the Russians were greatly helped by the spies' information. Initially, even the left knew that the Rosenbergs were guilty, including the communist press, which dutifully changed its tune in 1952 when the Soviets began to put on their own show trials in Prague and needed PR cover. Even the left-leaning Wikipedia online encyclopedia admits, quote, Venona was added, has added significant information to the case of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, making it clear that Julius was guilty of espionage, but also showing that Ethel was probably no more than an accomplice, if that, end quote. Venona, a long-running 
cryptanalysis project of Soviet intelligence agencies confirmed that the entire notion that the Rosenbergs were convicted for merely being communist was absurd and that Soviet sympathizers and agents whipped up the original demonstrations against the verdict to <clears throat> excuse me to deflect international criticism from their own Czech show trials most of them against Jews Hence, the Jewishness of the Rosenbergs became a factor for the first time. Jewishness. Once the USSR fell, the trickle of information from behind the former Iron Curtain became a flood, and even the Rosenbergs were innocent crowd had trouble discrediting the former communist sources. For example, in October 1995, the Soviet spy... Anatoly Yatskov, known to the U.S. to the CIA as Yakovlev, told the Washington Post that the stolen material was of quote huge invaluable significance end quote for Soviet science, enabling the Soviets to quote bypass many laborious phases involved in tackling the uranium problem and revealing new scientific and technical ways of solving it, end quote. Yatskov also confirmed that gold was a courier and he implicated the Rosenbergs directly by confirming that two other American communists, Morris and Lana Cohen, who were subsequently arrested in London for spying after they fled the United States, had recruited Julius Rosenberg to work for the KGB. Venona identified Julius, codename Liberal, showed that he was an active spy recruiter and revealed previously unknown parallel spy rings known by, run by Joel Barr and Alfred Sarant. More important, Venona decryptions identified Ethel as equally active in recruiting spies as Julius. After Venona and the revelations of the other post iron curtain documents the guilt of the rosenbergs is no longer in doubt more troubling however is the extent to which the kgb clearly was operating inside the united states as radosh and milton note of the venona materials quote they reveal a consistent use of the kgb of the communist party usa a teenager might well think duh here as well as of its front organizations such as the Federation of Architects, Engineers, Chemists, and Technicians, end quote. And it wasn't just the atomic bomb materials that the Rosenbergs and their merry band of communist spies were passing along. They transmitted information on rockets, airplanes, and radar, all areas in which the United States led the Soviet Union. If all that <clears throat> if all that weren't enough, the Discovery Channel located Julius Rosenberg's KGB supervisor, Alexander Feklisov, the officer at the New York Russian consulate from nineteen forty to nineteen forty six. An informant who shared a cell with Rosenberg told investigators that Julius reported to a man named Alex, and Feklisov's alias showed up in the Venona decryptions as the agent who had been in Rosenberg's apartment. Even Radish and Milton considered anathema to the left after letting the evidence considered anathema to the left after letting the evidence lead them to the conclusion that Julius was a was certainly guilty cling to the notion that quote the use of the death penalty for Ethel was improper and unfair end quote a sober reading of the horrendous acts of these two spies however leads to a much different conclusion more in line with that of Judge Kaufman when the Rosenbergs were executed on June 19th, 1953, they both deserved every watt they got. And that's the end of that one. That's lie number 19. The next one's only three pages. The next two are only three pages each, so I'm going to try to get through both of them. 
so this one's um oh, okay so line number 20 is lee harvey oswald shot jfk because he was a deranged marine not because he was a communist and then we have one quote oswald was a troubled former marine eric fauner give me liberty all right so is our sound still working yes okay everything's good temperature's good okay a majority of textbooks identify john f kennedy's killer as quote a 24 year old ex-marine drifter and and a 24 year old misfit who had served in the marines uh okay sorry these are from different sources so the first one 24 year old ex-marine drifter is tyndall and she from the book america or whatever and then the next one is 24 year old misfit who had served in the marines and that's goldfield et al american journey then uh let's see morrison commager and luchtenberg's concise history of the american republic noted oswald quote had once expatriated himself to russia note not the soviet union end quote boydston et al in making a nation describe him as a quote quiet former marine who spent time in the soviet union end quote harrell et al in unto a good land added to the typical description of oswald as a quote deeply disturbed former marine the key identifying factor and self-professed marxist end quote why do you suppose these textbooks eagerly describe oswald as a marine but only one mentioned he was a marxist and none correctly identified him as what he was a self-described communist Howard Zinn's A People His, People's History of the United States, which does not deal with JFK's death, does not even mention Oswald, possibly because to do so would require acknowledging his communist sympathy, sympathies. Likewise, James E. Lowen's Lies My Teacher Told Me avoids any mention of Oswald. In fact, however, as a new book by James pearson shows oswald's communism was the motivating factor in his murder of the president though leftists including historians such as arthur schlesinger conveniently omitted any reference to oswald's communism pearson notes that quote the assassination of a popular president by a communist should have generated a revulsion against everything associated with left-wing left doctrines.